tonight's message, When Good Men Die Like Fools. When Good Men Die Like Fools. If you have your copy of God's book, would you please turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 3. 2 Samuel chapter 3, and we'll begin there at verse 32. 2 Samuel chapter 3, and we'll begin at verse 32. Uh, the next passage we're going to look at is going to be found in Joshua chapter 20. But 2 Samuel chapter 3, beginning at verse 32, would you please stand with me as we show our love and respect for the Word of God. Now before I read the text, let me make mention of this. Ivan Turgenev, a Russian poet, made this statement. I do not know what the heart of a bad man is like, but I do know what the heart of a good man is like, and it is terrible. The heart's wicked above all things, and only God can know our hearts. We, we can fool ourselves, but God knows the heart. Amen? Just be mindful of that. Uh, even good people die like fools. Even good people are sometimes not wise, and I want you to be mindful of that as well. Now, here's the text, 2 Samuel 3, beginning at verse 32. And they buried Abner in Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept, and the king lamented over Abner and said, died Abner as a fool dieth. And if we would put it in the modern language, Abner died like a fool. Now let me continue uh, to read. Thy hands, verse 34, were not bound, nor thy feet put in fetters. As a man falleth before wicked men, so fellest thou. And all the people wept again over him. And then drop down to verse 38, if you would. And the king said unto his servants, Know ye not, that there is a prince and a great man fallen this day in Israel. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, do make us mindful. Though some of us are good people, some of us may even be great people, founded a business, had people working for us, maybe uh, made some discovery, maybe have all kinds of degrees, maybe even have a, a, a small fortune or maybe a great fortune. Maybe a lot of people have called us boss through the years. But, oh God, help us not to die like a fool. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Be seated, please. Some time ago, Bill Gates was asked this question. And by the way, he's one of the wealthiest men on the face of this planet. He said, do you go to church? He said, no. They said, why not? And here was his answer. Quote, it is a waste of time. Unquote. Folks, I want to tell you a little secret. Could you imagine somebody saying that the church that Jesus Christ died for, gave His blood for, that He literally raised from the dead for, and that He's coming again for? Could you imagine somebody saying that God's church is a waste of time? You might have all the money on this face of this planet. You might have thousands of people working for you, but I'm telling you what, you are a fool to call what God counts important a waste of time. Amen? Now, when I think about that, I think of Lance Armstrong, uh, the bicycle rider. And you know, he uh, supposedly won seven of these great races over in France. But he never gave God the glory. He was healed from cancer. And he never gave God the glory. He never would talk about God in any shape, form, or fashion. I've got news for you. Unless Lance Armstrong repents of his sin and turns to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lance Armstrong is going to die like a fool. He got what he wanted in this life. But he missed out on what is very important and the most important. The Bible is all about Jesus Christ. 
In fact, the whole book of the Bible, Old and New Testament, literally, is talking about salvation and how we can come to know God personally as our Lord and Savior. And the entire Bible is loaded from Genesis to Revelation with story after story after story, example after example, illustration after illustration of the salvation that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. I made mention of this last night. I probably will again tomorrow tomorrow night, Jesus said, the Old Testament scriptures speak of me. In the book of Acts, there's something that happens seven times that very seldom happens here in modern times. They preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection from the Old Testament scriptures alone. Seven times. And folks, we need to get a picture. Do you realize some 85% of the Bible is written to Jews? And if we don't understand that setting and that background, we can't fully see what Jesus Christ is doing for us and who He really, really is. Now, uh, the Bible speaks of this man Abner. And David, King David, said he was a great man and he was a great man. He was Saul's general. He was great in the eyes of men and mighty in war. And yet, as mighty as he was, as brilliant as as he was, he died like a fool. And you say, Brother Keith, why did David say that he died like a fool? Well, once again, we're going to look at the Old Testament passage, and we're going to see and understand what God was talking about. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 20, and let's look at verses 1 through 3. Joshua chapter 20, and let's look at verses 1 through through three. Now, if you've got a pen or pencil, you're going to want to get it out because you're going to make a lot of notes here. In fact, just keep your Bible open to this passage. Even if I read from other passages, please keep your Bible open to this passage. You want to circle some words and write some things out in the margin. If there's a piece of paper laying around you or that bulletin somewhere to write on, you might want to use that even this night. Joshua 20, beginning at verse 1. The Lord also spake unto Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for you cities of refuge. I want you to underline cities of refuge. They are a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say, Where have I spake unto you by the hand of Moses, uh, that the slayer that killeth any person unawares and unwittingly may flee thither? And they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. Now go down to verse 7 of this same chapter, please. Keep that pen or pencil out. And they appointed, <clears throat> and they appointed uh, Kadesh in Galilee, underline Kadesh, in Galilee, in Mount Naphtali, and Shechem in Mount Ephraim, and Kiriath Harba, which is Hebron or uh, in the mountain of Judah, and on the other side of Jordan, and by the way, underline Kadesh and Hebron and Shechem, please. And on the other side of the Jordan, by Jericho uh, eastward, they assigned Bezer in the wilderness upon the plain out of the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth in Gilead out of the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan out of the tribe of Manasseh. And these were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel." Cities of refuge. Now what were the cities of refuge for? Those cities of refuge were for manslaughter. Now today we've got all kind of laws. We just had a huge trial in Florida where a man got in a fight uh, with another man. And uh, that six foot two uh, black fella, we still don't know all the details. We do know that there was blood on the face of the man that shot him and killed him. Uh, and we don't, without being at the trial myself, I got no idea what really happened. But I'm, I'm wanting to tell you, we've got so many laws in America. If you kill somebody in self-defense, we've got a law for that. Well, in the Bible days, they didn't have a law for that. If you kill somebody, their next of kin was called the avenger of blood. And they had the right by law to kill you. And the only way somebody who committed uh, murder by self-defense or uh, kill somebody by accident, the only way they could live is they would have to flee from their location to one of these cities of refuge. And if they would get to the city of refuge, then inside that city, they could not be killed. They couldn't have anything done to them. But if they left that city and went outside that city, even stepped outside the gate, the avenger of blood could kill 
those people. And in a few minutes, you're going to see why that's so important. Now, let me apply this to you and me tonight. When Jesus was on the cross in Luke 23, 34, and you don't have to turn there. Stay where you are if you would. Here's what he said. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I'm here to tell you, people often say to me, Brother Keith, I didn't know the law. I didn't know when I was breaking God's law what I was doing. And so Jesus said, that's manslaughter. Jesus said, that's committing a sin not knowing that you're committing the sin sometimes. But that doesn't make any difference if you sin, whether it's of knowledge or of no knowledge. It's still sin. It's still breaking God's law. And God when He came to earth to die for us on the cross, said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Jesus was literally saying, now I am become the city of refuge for every sinner on the face of the earth. All that run to Me, all that come to Me, all that are in Jesus, that are in Christ, are in a city of refuge. Now let's talk about, for the next few moments, the saving nature of these particular uh, cities. And as we think about that, the Bible says, and I, again, I'm going to just read it, don't worry about it, it's Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 through 20, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, that we might have a strong consolation who fl have fled for refuge. So in the New Testament, we flee to who for refuge? To Jesus for refuge. To lay hold upon the hope that's set before us, which hope we have as an anchor for our soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And now, as we think about this, I want to point out to you the significance of each of these cities. Uh, those who fled to Jesus are guaranteed salvation. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and are safe. And when we run into the Lord Jesus, we come, become a part of His kingdom. We become His child. Then we have a refuge that lasts through eternity. And boy, it's going to be fun to be at His house and in His city. Amen. And we get to look forward to that one day. You remember the old song, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Where could I go, the old song said, seeking refuge for my soul, where could I go but to the Lord? And that's the only place we can go to find that refuge. Now, let's talk for the next few moments about the significance of each of these cities. And if you're still in Joshua chapter 20, I want you to underline that word or circle the word Kadesh. Kadesh means holiness. Kadesh means holiness. It speaks of Christ, our dear Lord and Savior, as a holy, perfect Savior. He never sinned, not in his thoughts and not in his actions. Perfectly holy. Amen. And the Bible says that you and I need to be holy. Uh, Hebrews 7.26 says, For such an high priest uh, became, uh, for us who is, came for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. And as I quoted last night or read last night in the book of Zechariah, In that day uh, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. If you don't have holiness, you'll never see God. Now, I'm, I don't want to get off on this because i got a whole sermon on this one point. But I simply want to tell you this. In the game of life, we come up to bat. The devil is on the pitcher's mound. And buddy, he's got some balls that he's going to throw. If I do more good things than I do bad things, I go to heaven, strike one. Listen, folks, you got to be totally perfect. Not break the law in one point to get to heaven that way. Amen? And then he's going to throw another pitch. Well, if I do some super good things, really good, the extra works, steer right too. It don't work that way. The man's righteousness in God's eyes is like a filthy rag. And that's a picture of a leper taking a rotten, stinking 
filthy dead flesh rag off his arm and throwing it in the trash. God says the best you and I can do it is in his eyes is a filthy rag. So what we need is a, we need somebody to come take the bat out of our hand. We need a substitute batter. And the only person that's ever knocked a home run every time he came to the plate morally and spiritually is Jesus. And we need to say, Lord, take my unrighteousness and replace it with your righteousness, your holiness, your goodness. Amen? And that's how anybody will ever get into heaven. Now, I want you to say that with me. Christ is the holy place. Say it with me. Christ is the holy place. Now, secondly, I want you to look at Shechem. Shechem means shoulder or strength. Shechem means shoulder or strength. Brother Keith, what's that talking about? Not only is Christ a holy place, He is a helpful place. Would you say that with me? Jesus is a helpful place. Say it with me. Jesus is a helpful place. And He is. And Shechem means a shoulder or a, a, a strength. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And when uh, the story is given in uh, Luke chapter 15 about the good shepherd, Jesus, going to find uh, his sheep, when he finds that old sheep, what does he do with him? He picks him up and he makes him a six-legged sheep. Four of his own and two of the good shepherds. And Jesus does the carrying. And I'm here to tell you, any way any person's going to get to heaven is we're going to have to get on Jesus' shoulders to get there. And I want you to know that uh, that is the only way uh, to get to heaven. He's our, you need strength. Jesus is our strength. The joy of, of the glory of the Lord, the Bible speaks of, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And then thirdly, I want you to notice that place called Hebron. And if you would just circle that and write out in the margin, uh, fellowship. Fellowship. That's what it means, fellowship. And it really means harmonious fellowship. Christ is the harmonious place. Say that with me. Christ is the harmonious place. But when you get Jesus in you, you can get along with folks. When you're really, really right with Him and you're tired and you're ill and it's the end of vacation Bible school week or whatever time it is, and you want to just be mean as a snake, there's harmony in your heart that don't come from you. It comes from who? Jesus. And He, indeed, is the harmonious one. Here's what it says in 1 John 1, 7, and we've read that more than once this week. But if you walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Folks, if we're walking in His light, if we have His fellowship, that makes me come to know people. Brother Phil, I've always wanted to be with you, and you didn't even know that probably, but I have. Because I loved you when we came over, because I knew Jesus was in you when I went to your radio station the first time many years ago. And, and isn't it something that we can meet people we've never known, and there's a there's a fellowship there. Well, what's that fellowship, Brother Keith? It's Jesus. Amen? Jesus in you and Jesus in me. Oh, that's another whole sermon right there. And what a blessing it is. And then I want you to notice Bezer down there, that next city. Uh, Bezer means stronghold. It means fortification. Uh, you remember the verse we read a while ago, the righteous run in and they are safe. When we go into the Lord Jesus, we have found a hiding place. And Jesus is our hiding place. Amen? Say it with me. Jesus is our hiding place. And we can run into Him. And we can be safe. We can go to Him. Uh, and oh, what a difference it makes to know the Lord Jesus. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and are safe. That's Proverbs 18.10. Once again, I want you to know that the hound of hell is chasing after every soul in this building tonight. And that hound of hell would take us to hell. But if we run to Jesus, he cannot take us to hell. And so what does the devil do? 
Well, what he does is, is he tries to trip us up, get us discouraged, get our thinking off and our eyes off Jesus. And when we get our eyes off Jesus, we get in trouble. And so we need to remember that Jesus is our hiding place. And we need to hang in there and let God bless because of that. We're absolutely secure from judgment because of Jesus. Now, notice the next place is Ramoth. And Ramoth means exalted. It means the highest place. Ramoth means exalted or the highest place. Now, Brother Keith, what in the world does that mean Jesus is? Well, it means that Jesus is the highest. Amen? Jesus is the highest place. Say it with me. Jesus is the highest place. He is the highest. And uh, what does the Scripture uh, say about that? Well, uh, there's nothing higher than Jesus. Brother Keith, I want more. You, listen, if you got Jesus, you can't get no more. <laughs> Amen? Everything you need, ever going to need, is all found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 2.33 uh, uh, says this, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, He has shed forth this, which ye now see, and here, and that was on uh, the day of Pentecost when God poured out His Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, on to all of mankind. And then Philippians 2.9, one of my favorite verses, Wherefore God hath also highly exalted Him, and given Him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things uh, in hell, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Folks, you won't find anything better than Jesus. In fact, the whole book of Hebrews is saying how Jesus is better. Amen. <laughs> and what a great uh, book that is. And then let's move quickly to Golan. And Golan means separated. Golan means walled or fenced off. And uh, Christ is that separate place. In fact, Christ is our happy place. I, I like to use that word uh, happy. And you say, well, Brother Keith, why do you say that? Well, because the word separate uh, carries the idea of that in 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And then it goes on to say uh, in another passage, Luke 6, 22 through 23, Blessed are ye when men hate you, and when they shall separate you away from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast you. Uh, out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner did their fathers do unto the prophets. And I remember uh, some years ago, a, a fellow was all upset. And he, he said, I, 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 I'm just miserable. And another fellow said, why are you doing miserable? God counts you worthy to suffer shame for his name. Amen? Count it all joy when men persecute you and when you're mistreated because God is counting you worthy and your reward in heaven shall be great uh, because of that. Now, you show me a person who's turned loose of this world, both hands, just turned it loose, and who's latched on to Jesus with both hands. And I'll show you the happiest man on the planet. And that happiest man might be like Paul sitting in a jail cell. Chained to a guard. Eating bread and water. And what did he do? He told that guard about Jesus. <laughs> but he was happy and had joy. Unspeakable. Why? Because of his position in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now quickly, I want to talk about the strategic nearness of these cities. Miklot. Miklot. M-I-K-L-O-T. That's a Hebrew word. And it literally means refuge. And there were six of these cities of refuge. They were on both sides of the Jordan River. And by the way, Israel's not but on one side of the Jordan River. And they keep talking about the West Bank. Man, the West Bank is Israel. Israel's supposed to be on both sides of the Jordan River. And they don't have both sides today. One day that's going to happen. But they don't have both sides today. And that event will one day occur in the future. But the roads to the city of refuge were kept broad and clear. If there was a river, a bridge was put over that river. 
if there was anything to hinder, anything at all. And there were signs so that there wouldn't be any confusion. One city that way, one city this way. Those cities of refuge had big, huge signs. And each one of those was within a day's journey. In other words, if you accidentally killed somebody or if you killed somebody in self-defense, you could take off running right then and before the day was out, you would be at one of these six cities. And you would be safe and you would not be executed or you would not be murdered. Uh, the cities of refuge are near. You say, Brother Keith, what's that got to do with us tonight? Well, I'm going to read from Romans chapter 10 and you might want to turn there. Feel free if you do. Romans 10 verses 6 through 9. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead? But now listen to it. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee. The word is near thee is what it's saying. The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And you might want to say it with me, that if thou shalt confess, say it with me, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The word is nigh thee. It's literally in your mouth. It's in your thinking. It's in your heart. You say, Brother Keith, how do you know that? Wait a minute, I don't think it's near me. The Bible says in Romans 10, 8, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, in thy heart, the word of faith which we preach. Say it with me again, that if thou shalt confess, say it with me, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, say it with me, the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, and shalt believe in thine heart, that God hath raised him from the dead. Say it with me. That God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Now folks, I want to hear, I want to let you know tonight that you have heard the word of God. And it's in your mouth. Brother Keith, I didn't say it out loud, but you couldn't help but think it because we said it about three times. It's right there on you right now. And folks, you've got to receive it. You've got to open your life. You've got to run to Jesus and get in the city of refuge. Let me say a word about baptism for just a moment. Some time ago, a Baptist preacher was on an airplane, and like me, I try to witness to the people who sit next to me if I get a chance, and I generally do. And he was talking to a man, but he happened to have a preacher seated next to him. And that preacher uh, was from a denomination that believes you have to be baptized to get into heaven. Now, folks, you're baptized after you're saved. You're not baptized to get into heaven. You're baptized to identify with Jesus. And while they were talking, this Baptist preacher said to this preacher from the other denomination, he said, uh, if the plane pilot were to make an announcement right now and say we're uh, coming in for a landing, but we've got no control and no airport, we're going to crash. And if you need to make your peace with God, you got five minutes before we hit the ground. And they gave you a microphone and said to you, Mr. Preacher, how can every man, woman on this airplane get into heaven? In fact, let's just say I'm not, not a preacher, that I was just a, a businessman. I've been running around on my wife, going to bars at night, bending my elbow, drinking alcohol. And let's just say, for talking's sake, that I said to you, could you tell me how to get to heaven? And that preacher from the other denomination said, well, there are things that you need to do first. He said, sir, we don't have time to do things we need to do first. He said, no, I couldn't tell anybody on this plane how to get to heaven in the next five minutes. And the Baptist preacher said, well, I, I can tell you how. <laughs> Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved right now before five minutes is up, before we hit the ground. Now, if we don't hit the ground, you'd want to be baptized and get in church and be active. But to be saved, 
You need to call on the name of the Lord. There's nothing you can do but call on Him. Nothing you can do but trust in Him. And by the way, the Bible never counts belief as works. It's the opposite of works. Works is you do something. Belief is, Lord, I can't do anything. You've done it all, and I'm counting totally on you. Amen? That's belief. And so tonight, if you've not done that, I'm going to ask you to open your heart and let the Lord Jesus Christ come in. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. The word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, I want to talk about the, the neglect of these cities. And I've got two or three points, and we're going to conclude the sermon. Brother Keith, why did Abner die like a fool? Abner had been in a battle, and he fought against Joab, that was David's general, and Asahel, who was Joab's brother, and Abishai. Abishai was another captain of, uh, of the Lord, and he was David's captain, and he happened to be the brother to Joab, and happened to be uh, the brother to Asahel. Now Asahel, the Bible says, was one of the fastest men who's ever lived. He was fleet of foot. He could keep up with horses running. So during this battle, Abner, the general for Saul, had lost the battle. And he was fleeing and he was running away. But Asahel, he began to run after Abner. And he didn't stop. He kept running after him. And Abner's popping those horses, get me on out of here, get this chariot, let's go. But they couldn't outrun Asahel. And he kept running, and he finally said, Is that Asahel? He said, I'm Asahel. He said, Would you turn to the right or turn to the left? Because if you don't, I'm going to have to kill you. And if I kill you, I'll have to answer to your brother, Joab. He said, I'll not turn to the left, I'll not turn to the right. And he continued chasing him. And finally, when he got close to the chariot, Abner took a spear and smote and by the way, that means he just rammed it into his side, under his fifth rib, went through his liver and his pancreas. And they say that's one of the most painful deaths a man can die. Just stabbed him through his liver and through his uh, pancreas there. And when he did, Asahel died. And all that were chasing after Abner and his r army that was running away, when they got to Asahel, they just stopped dead in their tracks. Now Joab came to his brother and he stopped, but then he went on along with Abishai to chase after Abner, literally till the sun went down and then he quit. But here's what happened. Saul being dead, Abner was called to come to the city of Hebron by David. And he said, I want you to come. I'm not going to kill you. In fact, I want you to come into fellowship I want you to be a part of Israel, and I want you to bring all of Saul's armies and make them part of Israel's armies, of Judah's armies, of my armies. And Abner said, I'll come. And because he'd been the oldest and the greatest general in Israel, David was even going to put him over Joab. And so they had this meeting, and when they got through the meeting, David said to Abner, listen, I want you to go to another city and I, I want you to gather up those other armies and make a speech and without us having any more war, the rebellion's over, let, let's come together. And so Abner said, I'll do it. And he hid it out away from the city of refuge and when he hid it out, everything was great until Joab, who'd been out on another errand for David, came to Hebron and found out that he'd met with Abner. It made him furious. And unknown to King David, Joab sent word to Abner to come back to Hebron. And so he came back. But he did not enter into the city. All he'd have done was had to step right inside the gate. And had he stepped foot inside the gate, Joab and Abishai could not have touched him. But instead thinking peace had been made, forgetting 
that Joab and Abishai were the avengers of blood and had the right to kill him anywhere he stepped foot outside any one of these cities. Stood just outside the gate. And when he did, Joab said, Come over here, Abner. I need to talk with you privately. I need to whisper something to you. And buddy, when he got over there, Joab took out his sword. Abishai, I suppose, held on to him, for it says both Abishai and Joab killed him. And he took that sword and put it under his fifth rib and rammed it through his liver and through his pancreas. And Abner died like a fool. Ten steps inside the city gate. They couldn't have touched him, preacher. But instead, he met with the avenger of blood like a fool. How many people die like fools? Good people, normal people. I told you the story last night of a 43-year-old woman up in Perry, Georgia, from California. I preached this sermon, and she got saved. She said, I know this church has been praying for me for over 30 years. And they had. But I've been living like a fool. I knew that Christ died for me. I knew he'd save me. But I've been living like a fool, and I would not ask him. Don't die like a fool tonight. They buried Abner in Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice, and he wept over the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner like a fool. Thy hands weren't bound. Your feet weren't in fetters. As a man falls before wicked men, so fellest thou. And all the people wept again over him. Judas died without Jesus. Judas kissed Jesus. He kissed heaven. He kissed the city of refuge and then walked away and ended up in hell. Don't do that tonight. Now, let me close with this illustration. Some years ago in Pennsylvania, Governor Pollock was a great godly, godly man, a Christian man. And I mean he was vocal in his Christianity. Everybody knew he was a real Christian. But Governor Pollock had a woman come to his office one day. And he was busy that day and he couldn't see her. And so the woman came in and said, I need to see Governor Pollock. I need to see him today. And the secretary said, you can't see him. He's in, but he's book solid. You can't see him. And she ran by the secretary, knocked the governor's door open, fell on her knees and began to weep and began to beg. Please, listen to what I've got to say. My son has committed murder. He is in prison. And I know he's better than that. I know he's worth saving. And, and you could give him a pardon. Wouldn't you please give him a pardon? And Governor Pollock said, I know the case. And your son's not worthy because of the crime he's committed to not be hung. And at that time, they hanged them in the state of Pennsylvania. And it so happened that because she wept and begged, the governor said, okay, I'll go see your boy, and I'll talk to him. I'm not going to tell you I'm going to give him a pardon. I'm just going to tell you I'm going to go talk to him. And the governor, being a Christian man in his heart, said, I know he's not worthy of it, but if he'll talk and repent of his sin and get saved, I might just give him life and not have him hanged. And so the governor went to the penitentiary. When he got there, they led him inside, and he went through several gates, and finally the jailer took him to death row and unlocked the door in which this young man was seated on his cot with his head looking down. I suppose he thought that the governor was a preacher. He didn't know who he was. He came in and said, Young man, I need to speak with you for a few moments. Will you talk with me? He wouldn't raise his head. He wouldn't look at him. He would not talk to him. Finally, he said, if you knew who I was, you would talk to me. He said, will you talk to And the young man just shook his head and didn't say a word. So finally, he said, well, I'm a busy man, and I took time out of a very important day to come speak with you. 
And the jailer unlocked the seal, let him out, closed it, and as he was locking the seal, the jailer said, Governor, it's good to see you. And the next jailer, as the, uh, the governor had already turned, was walking out of, of a death row, said to him, Governor, it's good to see you. And another one piped up, Governor, good to see you. That young man sat straight up on that cot, then stood to his feet, straight up, looking about. He said, you mean to tell me that's the governor of the state of Pennsylvania, the only man that could give me a free pardon, and I wouldn't even talk to him? And there's some of us who may be seated here tonight that are not willing to speak to the Lord Jesus Christ and to call on Him and say, Lord Jesus, please come in my heart and forgive my sin. That young man died the next day. He was hung. Folks, if you'll believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, Believe that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Will you do that tonight? I'm going to ask you to do it. Preacher, would you stand right here at the front? Uh, Lisa, would you make ready? Or whoever's going to sing our invitation tonight, lead us in it. I'm going to ask tonight, if you're not saved, to get yourself down this aisle, give your hand to this preacher, and give your heart to Jesus. Brother Keith, I don't go to this church. Well, whether you go to this church or not, Give your hand to this preacher, get saved. Tell this preacher where you go to church. He'll call your pastor and tell him you got saved here tonight. Amen? You say, Brother Keith, I, I, I do come to this church, and I, I, I need to be saved. Well, get yourself down here. Give your hand to the preacher, and he'll help you. Man, that night I got saved, I asked a boy, I said, what would I say to you? I didn't even know how to pray. He said, just say, Lord Jesus, come in my heart and forgive my sins. And I did. On my knees I said it, and I meant it. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus came in and saved me. Amen? I've done a lot of stupid things in my life. I still do some dumb things. But I tell you, the best thing I've ever done is call on Jesus and let him in my heart and as best I can turn loose of this world and grab hold of him. Amen? And I'm going to ask you to do that this very night. I want to ask if you're here and you say, Brother Keith, I'm a Christian, I'm saved. But even as a Christian, sometimes we act dumb. We don't spend time in prayer talking to Jesus. Folks, we need to talk to him more than we've been talking to him. Amen? It's our privilege to talk to him 24 hours a day. I like what uh, Brother Phil said. Just throughout the day, sentence prayers. Saying a word here and a word there to him. Even before Brother Phil does his uh, television show, he asks God to help him to do his best that day for him. Amen? And, and, and just any time you do anything, and I want to encourage you to do that. Let's stand for prayer, please. Stand for prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, I pray tonight that we would understand, every person in here, that the Word is nigh unto us. It's near us. Lord, not only is it near us, it's in our mind, it's in our thoughts, it's on our tongue, it's, it's in our heart. That if we'll call on you to save us, you will save us. Lord, you were raised from the dead. And tonight we want to call on you. And we want to do it publicly and unashamedly, like the Bible says. Lord, help us to confess you before men. That you might confess us before the Father in heaven. And oh God, how I ask tonight, if somebody needs to move their letter, they would. If somebody needs to answer the call to ministry, and Lord, we thank you for the one that did that yesterday, and uh, we heard the testimony of that, I pray you'd let somebody answer the call uh, to ministry here tonight. And oh God, don't let anybody leave without calling on the name of the Jesus, the name above all names. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Lord, save me. Live in me. Take control. Lord, I'm running to you for refuge. Be my hiding place. Be my fellowship. Oh, God, be my strong tower, my refuge. Lord, pick me up on your shoulders and carry me. God, have your way with me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need to